Hey guys and welcome back or if you're new around here hi my name's Georgia and on my platforms from the internet I talk about true crime. Sometimes I talk about solved cases, a lot of the time I talk about unsolved cases. Our episode today is kind of a multiple case in one situation focusing on an area called the Bennington Triangle where multiple people went missing between 1945 and 1950. Are we dealing with an unsolved serial killer case here or just a number of coincidences? This is described as Vermont's very own Bermuda Triangle and disappearances aren't the only weird thing that happened there. There's been reports of UFO sightings, paranormal activity, Bigfoot sightings. It's said to be cursed according to Native American folklore. One old Algonquin legend apparently warns of a malevolent stone somewhere in the mountains that would open up if you stepped on it, just devouring you in one. Or maybe is it just something about the vast landscape that makes people disappear, the thick wilderness making people disorientated? Locals know to watch out in this area, to not go wandering alone, but some do just brush it off as superstition, which is very easy to do until people really go missing. The so-called Bennington Triangle doesn't have an exact geographical boundary, but it is thought to centre on the Glastonbury Mountain in Bennington County in Vermont, including the surrounding towns of Bennington, Woodford, Shaftesbury and Somerset. These were all once thriving industrial towns which have kind of fallen by the wayside over the past few decades. Some of them are now ghost towns, metaphorically and maybe literally, depending on what you believe. In 1992, American author Joseph A. Citro penned the name of the Bennington Triangle when discussing the disappearances of five people in his books, and it's stuck ever since then. But let's discuss the cases of those five missing people, some of which do have more information available than others, but I'm going to do the best I can to tell all their stories. The first disappearance under the triangle is reported as being that of Middy Rivers, a very experienced 74 year old hiker who was incredibly familiar with the Glastonbury Mountain and the surrounding areas. On the 12th of November 1945, Middy was guiding a group of four hunters on a mountain trek, which was a route he had done so many times before, he should have known it like the back of his hand, he did know it like the back of his hand. But at Hell Hollow Brook, a location near the long trail of Vermont Route 9, on the way home, he went ahead of the group and then just inexplicably vanished. He left behind a single rifle cartridge and that was it, he was never seen again. Now I'm not familiar with guns and how they work so somebody please correct me if I'm wrong, but I assume a cartridge being left behind suggests that he shot his rifle at something. Just one single shot was at a person or an animal. What kind of person would abduct an elderly 74 year old man? What would be the motive here? All questions which have never been answered. Local people thought that Middy would just resurface eventually. He'd spent his entire life in this woodland. He had survival knowledge. If anyone could survive in the mountains for a period of time, it would be him but he didn't reappear. Firemen, local volunteers, even the US Army got involved in the search for Midi, which lasted anywhere from eight to 30 days, depending on which source you want to believe. And nothing bar the rifle cartridge was ever found. To this day, the case remains unsolved. A freak accident, people thought, it wouldn't happen again. But then the very next year, Paula Jean Weldon went missing in which is possibly one of the most infamous missing persons cases in Vermont history as it actually did lead to the creation of the Vermont State Police. Yeah, that feels wild that that wasn't a thing before, but it wasn't before this point. The state didn't have like a statewide police service. The amount of requests I've had to cover Paula's case over the last few years is absolutely unbelievable, which leads me to believe this case is still spoken about in the state today. And I must admit, it is a truly baffling story. Very similar to Middy just the year before, Paula just vanished into thin air. She went missing after going for a hike on a regular Sunday afternoon 78 years ago, and there's never been a single clue as to where she went. But we do have a bit more information about this case though. By the way, I'm really sorry if you can hear like noise in the background of this video, like one of my neighbors, like way in the distance, I can see him is literally like strimming his hedges and I've literally got to film this video now, otherwise it's not gonna be up in time. So excuse me if you can hear like a buzzing in the background. I'm hoping my mic's not picking it up, but just in case it is, that's what that is. I'm really sorry. 
Paula Weldon was born on the 19th of October 1928, meaning she would be 95 years old if she's still alive, just out there somewhere. And she could still be alive if she didn't die back in 1946. My great nan is 97 years old and she's amazing, still living a full fun life. Paula could have been too, maybe she is. I don't think that just because somebody would now be older, it makes looking for answers any less important. She was the oldest of four daughters to Jean Douglas and William Archibald Weldon, who was a very well-known engineer and architect. He was a man with a lot of money and a lot of power, which as you can imagine, comes back to play later in this episode. She was born and grew up in Stamford, Connecticut, where she graduated Stamford High School in 1945, before heading off to Bennington College in Bennington, Vermont, which is only about a three hour drive away. Paula didn't want to move away too far, but she was enjoying her newfound freedom as a college student. She was really beginning to come into her own as a person. In 1946, now a college sophomore, Paula was a very creative person. She played guitar, she painted, she loved to draw, and she was even majoring in art. However, recently her other great love, the outdoors, had begun to take over, so she was thinking of changing her major to botany instead, or maybe even music. She was young, the world was her oyster, she knew she loved to camp and hike, maybe she'd enjoy studying that more instead. She was really thinking about what she wanted to do with her life. The point is, Paula was planning ahead, she wanted to continue with her life. But that would all end on December 1st, 1946. This was a Sunday and it started like any other for Paula. She got up and went to work the breakfast and lunch shift at the university lunch hall. And then she headed back to her dorms at Dewey Hall where she chatted with her roommate for a while while she did some studying. Everything seemed completely normal with her and then she announced she was gonna go for a hike, which was again, pretty normal behavior. Paula loved hiking. She tried to convince some of her friends to go along with her, but it was a Sunday, nobody could really be bothered, so she went by herself. She can't have been planning to go out for long because by this point it was around 2.30pm and it was winter, Vermont tends to get dark around 5pm. Paula would have known this, but she went out anyway. And at the time she left, she was wearing a red parka with a fur trimmed hood, blue jeans and white top sider sneakers with heavy soles. She was kind of appropriately dressed for the weather that afternoon, but not for the weather that night. It's also noted she was wearing a small gold Elgin wristwatch with a narrow black band at the time she disappeared. And this watch had markings 130-50HB scratched on the inside of the back case after repair. So if you ever come across an Elgin wristwatch with those scratchings, it may be Paula's. As I said, she was well dressed for the weather of that afternoon, but she wasn't prepared for the colder weather that would come that night. Again, showing that she likely intended to return. Friends said that she didn't have much on her when she left. She didn't take an extra bag, no extra clothes. She didn't take any money with her. And she had plenty of money, including an uncashed check that her parents had sent her for her living expenses. So she just took the clothes that she had on her back. She left her dorm just after 2.30 p.m. and a witness called Lewis Knapp would later come forward saying that he picked Paula up near campus on State Route 67A around 2.45 p.m. She was hitchhiking, thumbing for a lift and he obliged. I always say it, but the concept of hitchhiking feels incredibly strange for us, a 2024 audience, but throughout the middle of the century, it was incredibly normal, especially in places like this that had less access to public transport. Quite often, the only way you could get to places, especially for students who couldn't afford to own their own cars, was to hitchhike. A lot of the time hitchhiking would be harmless, but I have covered countless stories on my platforms where that just hasn't ended well for people. But for Paula, it was fine. We have evidence Lewis dropped her off unharmed. She told him that she was headed to Long Trail off of Route 9 near Glastonbury Mountain, and so he dropped her off en route, about 2.5 miles away from the start of the trail. And I don't the trail, she stopped to speak to a group of hikers, and she asked them how long this walk went on for, to which she was told it went all the way up to Canada. Despite the fast approaching darkness, the sun will be setting in about an hour's time, she decided to persevere on this route. Now, Paula wasn't stupid when it came to hiking. It was something she did often. It was one of her biggest passions. She would have known how to stay safe. She would have been aware of the time it was gonna get dark. And to me, this is one of the most baffling things about this case, the fact that she continued. Maybe she thought she'd walk just a little bit further and then turn around, but the fact she never arrived back safely suggests that she likely didn't do that. 
Several other hikers would later report seeing her on this route, always alone, walking deeper into the ever-thickening woodland. Nobody ever saw her on the route back out. And then it got dark, about three inches of snow fell in the following hours, and she was gone. A man called Ernie Whitman would be the one who would eventually give investigators their first clue in this case, after seeing the front page of the local Bennington Evening Banner on the Tuesday. He said that he'd spoken to Paula around 4pm on Sunday. He was returning with three friends to Bennington from a camp in Woodford when she approached them and asked for directions to the Long Trail, saying that she was going to walk it. All of this group would agree that this was Paula after confirming what she was wearing, and so this is her last confirmed location, the last place we 100% know she was, whilst the rest of the sightings on the trail were sort of a bit iffy, nobody was entirely too sure, but we sort of know that she made it to the trail. When Paula didn't arrive home that night, her roommate wasn't too worried at first, like maybe she'd gone to hang out with a friend, but when she didn't come back the next morning, it was very clear that something was going on. The college had a whole security system when it came to students being off campus overnight, like students literally had to officially sign out if they planned on being out past 11pm and then they had to check in with security when they returned. The fact that Paula never checked out shows that she did intend to return before 11pm. So when she wasn't back by the next morning, the Monday, the roommate reported her as missing to the school and the search, which is still ongoing to this very day, began. The president of the college called her parents to inform them, to which Paula's mother reportedly fainted before her father, Archibald Weldon, sped to Bennington to help out with the search parties. Now, Paula's father, Archibald Weldon, was a very wealthy and powerful man, so he was really able to put pressure on Vermont's governor, Raymond Boulder, who made a call for surrounding states and experts to come in and assist. This is the surrounding state police, the state attorney, the county sheriff, and the state investigator because at this time, Vermont didn't have their own state police, so the search did take a bit of planning to get off the ground. Law enforcement from all the surrounding states, so Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New York, had to come in to assist, because without them, they had nothing. At this time, Vermont didn't have their own state police, so the search definitely took a bit of planning to get off the ground. Law enforcement from the surrounding states, so Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New York, all had to come in to assist. And before this point, Vermont was very much a self police state. Like, each town and county had their own leaders, their own small law enforcement, but nothing that covered the entire state. It was very much each town for themselves. But obviously, when something like this happens, it becomes pretty clear that a statewide police is needed because whose jurisdiction is the mountain? Local volunteers came out in their droves to help with the searches on foot whilst helicopters and aircrafts came in to search from the air. Paula was wearing a very distinctive red coat when she vanished, so she should have been easy to spot, but of course, she wasn't. The university even closed for several days as employees and students helped out in the search. There were literally hundreds of people walking the long trail, walking the mountain and looking for Paula. But there was never so much as a single clue as to what happened to her. She truly just vanished into thin air. And of course, when she was first reported as missing, nobody quite knew where she'd gone. She hadn't told her friends her exact plan, but then the man who gave her a lift came forward with his information and then Ernie Whitman, the hiker, so they were able to sort of focus a bit more on the long trail, but it did take a couple of days to get to that point. On the Tuesday, the Hartford Current reported that a Bennington student had told them that Paula had seemed a bit depressed lately, hinting that she may have chosen to take her own life or chosen to run away. State attorney William T. Jerome Jr. said at this point that he did not feel like Paula was the victim of foul play, but police officials did indicate that she may well have been a victim of amnesia. Basically, no one had a clue what was going on. But in those early days, multiple avenues were being explored. Like, did Paula get lost on the trail and succumb to the elements? If so, why couldn't they find her with so many volunteers? Did she run away and start a new life? Why would she leave all her money behind if that was the case? Did she take her own life? Again, where was her body? One of the only theories that made sense in the early days was that Paula had fallen victim to foul play, that somebody had hurt her and hidden her body, despite what the state attorney said. But yet, yeah, they weren't really exploring that. And this is where our first potential suspect comes into the picture, a local lumberjack called Fred Gadette. He lived in a cabin on the Long Trail and apparently he gave a number of very differing stories of the day Paula went missing. He just couldn't quite decide which story to tell, but most of them did involve some kind of argument with his girlfriend at the time. 
1946, Fred was considered a person of interest, and then again when the case was re-examined in 1952. In the years that followed, he would reportedly tell a number of people that he knew where Paula's remains were buried, and he did admit to seeing her on the long trail on the day she disappeared. But nothing ever really came from that. Here we've got a man who lived on the trail who was in a fight with his girlfriend at the time Paula was walking it. Could he have been angry and wound up, walked into the woods, came across Paula and she took the brunt of his anger? Is it that hard to keep a story straight for the police? Why would you keep changing stories if you're innocent and have nothing to hide? But despite being a person of interest, suspicions surrounding Adet didn't really go any further. If he truly did know where Paula was buried, he never shared that information with anyone. He later claimed he was lying when he said that, and he has since passed, so we'll never know for sure. It is very frustrating to me though that he wasn't looked at any further for this. Something was definitely going on with Fred Cadet. Why did he keep changing his story? And I wish I had more information I could share with you. I simply don't. But Fred wasn't the only person of interest at this time though. For a moment, all eyes were on her father, Archibald Weldon. A story circulated that shortly before Thanksgiving that year, Paula had had a falling out with her father over her boyfriend. Now, information about this mysterious boyfriend doesn't really exist. The Charlie Project even states that Paula had no interest in boys, but many other sources state a boyfriend was a cause of tension between her and her father, so who knows what the truth is there. But the rumour was that the pair had had a fight, Archibald was very worried about Paula bringing shame to the family, and so ended her life. Very much a rumour with nothing to back it up, but that's what people were saying at this time. And then, during the search for Paula, Archibald mysteriously disappeared himself for a day and a half. No one could contact him, no one had any idea where he'd gone. And when he resurfaced, it seemed he'd been chasing up on a lead in Massachusetts, but it just really didn't help the rumours. He also said that he'd visited a psychic who told him that Paula's boyfriend was the one responsible. But once again, I wasn't able to find any information about this apparent boyfriend. And everyone who saw her on her journey that day said she was alone. There was nobody with her. 18 nights after the disappearance, searchers dug up a gravel pit in Hayes Corner where over 500 tonnes of loose gravel was removed whilst they looked for her body. This reportedly came from the last tangible lead in the case after there were reports there was a landslide and it was thought that Paula may have been stood at the top when the ground just came out from underneath her. It was as good a theory as any, but there was no sign of Paula. In the weeks following, there were multiple sightings of Paula reported across the country. A waitress in Massachusetts said she saw her, a train conductor in South Carolina, but nothing ever really panned out. Paula just disappeared that December day and there's been no sign of her since. Maybe she really did just fall victim to the mountain, to the curse, to the Bennington Triangle. But the police in this case just failed entirely, or should I say the lack of police failed entirely. The only reason other state police even got involved here is because Archibald Weldon had to wield his power and his wealth to get them to pay attention. He would criticise the police's investigation in the following days, pointing out that no one kept any written records for 10 days after Paula's disappearance. There was no organisation to the search. If evidence was found, it certainly wouldn't have been recorded and kept properly. All of this led to outrage, and it was Paula's disappearance alone that would lead to the formation of the Vermont State Police the very next year in 1947. The Vermont State Police wrote on their Facebook page for their 75th anniversary in 2022. The case ultimately rallied Vermonters and their political leadership to launch the Vermont State Police after many years of hesitation and debate. So at least Paula's disappearance led to something good, although I doubt it made up for the pain felt by Paula's friends and family. But it did mean that by the time the next person went missing in the Bennington Triangle, they had a proper police force behind their search. James Tedford was a 68-year-old veteran who went missing on the 1st of December 1949, exactly three years after Paula. That day, he boarded a bus in Bennington that was headed for St Albans, and witnesses, family members who dropped him off, would later testify that he definitely boarded the bus at the stop. But when it arrived at his destination, he was nowhere to be seen. His belongings, however, were apparently all found on board, including his ticket and a bus timetable. 
Now my research tells me that James was living in a care home for veterans at the time he disappeared, and it seems his mental health wasn't great at this point. He may have been suffering from either dementia or maybe a bad case of depression or PTSD. It was bad enough that he was no longer living with his family and was at a care home instead. At face value, this really does seem like a very baffling case, but upon just a little bit more research, it seems to be just a sad case more than anything, as the bus driver would later mention that he remembers James getting off the bus in Brandon. Over the years, this story has been embellished and twisted to make it seem like James just vanished off the bus between stops, but that's really not the case. It seems he did get off, likely in a very confused state, and that's about all we know. There is a taxi driver in Brandon who would later say that he saw somebody matching James' description acting very odd later that night and that's about it. James was described as being very frail and emaciated. He was not in a good way and his family said he didn't want to go back to the care home so it does make sense that he would have gotten off the bus. And this is often quoted as being the strangest of the Bennington Triangle disappearances, but I really just don't think so. It's probably actually the disappearance that makes the most sense once you filter through all the media dramatization. James was mentally ill, he didn't want to go back, he got off the bus at one of the stops, he left everything behind and just wandered off. And nobody has ever been found, which is maybe the strangest thing about this case. I don't necessarily think that anyone else was involved in his disappearance. I think he was either disorientated and wandered off into the night succumbing to the December elements, or he chose to end his own life. Either way, his body has never been found. And to top off the rumours surrounding this case, there are stories he had a wife called Pearl who also mysteriously disappeared many years earlier, but once again, newspaper articles from this time do seem to debunk that. This is very much a case that has fallen victim to media speculation. It seems that James has actually been to visit Pearl on his trip that day. A year later, in 1950, eight-year-old Paul Jepson would also go missing. He's gone on a trip with his mother in the family truck so she could go and feed some pigs and while she left to do her chore, she left Paul playing very happily in the truck for over an hour. But when she returned, Paul was gone. The mother quickly raised the alarm and huge parties went out in search of the eight-year-old and despite that just like Paula, he was wearing a bright red jacket, there was never any sign of him. Bloodhounds apparently traced his scent to the nearest highway, which wasn't an area that Paul would usually have wandered off to, and from there they lost the scent, as if he'd just been grabbed and placed in a car. Apparently this was the same highway from which Paula had also disappeared four years earlier, but that may just be rumours. I couldn't find any like particular location of this case, apart from the fact that it was in the Bennington Triangle. Paul's case became pretty big in the local media, and there were many reported sightings of him over the coming days. One motorist told Vermont State Police that she believed that she had seen him near North Hoosick, which is just over the New York border, about 11 miles away. She described a young boy walking along the road wearing a red sweater shirt and brown trousers. She also said his hair was light and in desperate need of a cut. But Paul's father, Paul Sr, told police that this didn't sound like his son. Yes, his hair was long but wasn't in need of a cut, and Paul also walked with a very distinctive gait. If this was him, the woman would have commented on that. And to this day, Paul has never been found. In my eyes, there are two possibilities in this case. Paul either just wandered off into the wilderness and something happened to him and he died, he just wasn't found. Two, he wandered to the highway and somebody picked him up in a car and sadly, he was abducted. The final case often linked to the Bennington Triangle was that of Frieda Langer, who also disappeared in 1950, just 18 days after Paul vanished. Frieda was 53 years old and she was camping with her family near the Somerset Reservoir. Her and her cousin Herbert Elsner left the camp to go on a hike, but shortly after, Frieda slipped and fell into a stream, causing her clothes to become wet. At this point, they weren't too far from the campsite, so she told Herbert to wait there, she's gonna nip back and get changed into something dry. But then, she never returned. Eventually, Herbert wandered back to the camp himself to see what was going on, and he found from the rest of the family that Frida had never returned. In the short walk back, she had disappeared, and this was said to be an area that Frida was very familiar with. She shouldn't have got lost here. Once again, the alarm was raised and multiple searches were conducted with 300 searchers, dogs, aircrafts, helicopters, and not a single trace of her was found. The reservoir area was checked with the idea that Frieda may have fallen into the water, but she wasn't there. 
They searched on foot all through the night and Frida's husband, Max, who was back at the campsite when she disappeared, offered a $100 reward to anyone who found her dead or alive. And despite the searches, there was no sign of her. That is until May 1951, seven months later, when her body was found three and a half miles from the campsite near the Deerfield River. This area had been searched at the time, but it wasn't the main focus. She could have been missed, although it did seem highly unlikely. To this day, lots of people believe she was later dumped in this spot, knowing it had already been searched. Due to the state of her remains, no cause of death has ever been confirmed for Frida, so we don't know if it was natural, if she was a victim of foul play. What we do know is she was an experienced hiker and survivalist. We know she knew these woods well. She would have known how to survive long enough to find her way back to the camp. The idea that she got lost and died in these woods was unbelievable to all who knew her, but equally the idea that she came across somebody with nefarious intentions in the very short walk back to the camp also seemed unbelievable. Even though they found her bodies, there are no answers as to what actually happened. Although all these five people disappeared in the same area, there's nothing more to link their cases. Without bodies in four out of the five cases, there's little or nothing in terms of evidence. Some people do think a serial killer was active in this area at the time, hiding away in the wilderness, just waiting to come across lone people. They wouldn't have had much of an MO apart from that. We're spanning from eight-year-old boys to teenage girls to elderly men here. Most serial killers tend to have more of a pattern that they follow. They don't just grab people at random. But maybe this one did, who knows? Some people think something paranormal was going on. Perhaps some people believe the Algonquin curse, that something bad happens to those alone in the mountain. As a forever skeptic when it comes to anything paranormal or supernatural, I can't say that's my personal belief, but it might be yours. And just because I don't believe it, doesn't mean it's not necessarily true. Other people believe that nature is the culprit, perhaps animals, bears or mountain cats coming across prey and attacking. Maybe there was just a lone, particularly violent mountain cat because most aren't gonna really attack people unless they're provoked. If not animals, maybe the weather could be to blame. Experienced hikers and people who live in this region speak of very heavy fogs which descend without warning, which can cause even the most experienced of hikers to become confused and disorientated. Once you lose the path, it can be very, very difficult to get yourself back onto it. You just head further and further in the wrong direction into the wilderness. You're then dealing with rugged terrain, steep drops and all sorts of natural hazards. And whilst this could perhaps explain people getting injured and dying, it doesn't necessarily explain the lack of bodies or lack of evidence in most of these cases. Personally, I don't really subscribe to the theory that all of these cases are linked. I just generally think we're dealing with a series of unfortunate events here, perhaps all people who just fell victim to nature. Even the most experienced people can still fall victim. And although Frida's case is the last one to come under the umbrella of the Bennington Triangle, it doesn't mean she's the last person to ever disappear in this area. 1950 kind of just marked the end of this particular spate of disappearances. Five and five years is quite a lot, especially when they're all as mysterious as the next. But over the years, so many people have disappeared in the Glastonbury Mountain, like so many people. And whilst I do personally subscribe more to the theory of nature being the culprit at play here, I do think most of these were just people wandering off into the wilderness and getting lost. The case of Paula Jean Weldon does give me pause there because I am very suspicious of that lumberjack who changed his story multiple times. It is not out of the question that he may have had something to do with it. Maybe not, I don't know, wasn't there. But she is the only case where I think foul play could be at play. Please do let me know in the comments your personal theories as to these disappearances. What do you think happened? If you're from this particular area, from around the Bennington Triangle, from near Glastonbury Mountain or any of the towns I've mentioned today, please give me your sort of like personal experiences. It, like I really always try and include a lot of context in these cases. I try and like really get into the mind of a local, but I've never been to this area. I don't live there. I'm just trying to share the stories as they have come across to me in my research. So if you actually live there and you can give a personal experience, that is so much more helpful. Thank you for tuning in today and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.